It's good to see you. I'm excited to be with you today because I'm going to be talking about something that all human beings struggle with at one time or another. Fear. Fear. If you were to list your top 10 fears, what might they be? An irrational fear sometimes starts with what if? What if something bad happens today? Look at your fear list. What if this happens or this happens or this happens? What if I get on an airliner and the airliner goes down? We get on to an airliner and we become afraid because we don't have control. So oftentimes what's on our what if list are those things that we have no control over. Fear is related to vulnerability. Vulnerability. We're particularly afraid to offer love and to receive love. If I'm going to love somebody else, another precious image bearer, I'm going to have to become vulnerable. What if someone hurts me? What if someone rejects me? What if someone manipulates me? And the what, if, what ifs grow, develop, and sooner or later, the parameter of our, our life, our willingness to move beyond our comfort zone, shrinks dramatically. What are you afraid of? To whom are you afraid of becoming vulnerable? And, and it's surely right to be thinking, well, if you had had my life experiences, if you had had my mother, if you'd had my father, you'd know why I'm afraid. And that fear now you sense is seeping into other areas of your life. And when this happens, and God bless every one of you who've been abused in some way, it's, it's entirely rational to be afraid of an abuser. Abusers are dangerous people. That's a rational fear. But what can happen is, what happens here in this area of fear in our life seeps into other areas of our life where we, we don't need to be afraid. What Jesus would have us do is to slowly take steps, slowly take steps towards courage. Courage is the willingness to face what needs to be faced the courage to grow in areas where it seems safer to stay just where we are. Now, our, our uh, desert friend for today is an interesting man. He lived about 200 years after some of the desert dwellers we've talked about. His name is Dorotheus of Gaza. Dorotheus of Gaza is someone who is familiar with desert teaching and being familiar with the desert teaching, knew that love is at the heart of desert teaching and practice. He thought a lot about this. And there's an image that he used, an illustration that he used, that I think is uh, very helpful. Dorotheus' circle. It's a very famous illustration from ancient Christian times. Dorotheus' circle. So we have, we have the circumference of the circle. Can you see it? The circumference of the circle. And at the center of the circle, the very center of the circle is God. Now imagine, imagine all God's precious image bearers on the circumference of the circle. Imagine members perhaps of your church, they're on the circumference of the circle. And each 
image bearer on the circumference of the circle is going to take a step towards God. Can you see them? They're all going to take a step towards God. As, as they're getting closer to God, think of all those folks on the circumference of the circle, all those lines moving closer to the center of the circle. They are drawing near to God, and who else are they drawing near to? All those other precious image bearers. That's Dorotheus' circle of love. His point being, in a nutshell, the closer we draw near to God, and the wonder and beauty and gentleness and kindness of God, the closer we'll draw to one another. Let's join ourselves in the living room. We're all drawn up chairs. We're thinking about Dorotheus' circle. He was a kind guy, gentleman. Do knock on the door, door opens up and there's Dorotheus. And he says in this more gentle voice, oh, it's good to be with you. I understand you've been learning about my circle. So he says, let me, let me recommend something for those of you in the living room who are struggling with fear and struggling with love and the willingness to give and receive love. I want to recommend something very practical to you. I want you to take the next five to 10 years to learn as much as you can about God's love and about love in general. I want you to immerse yourself in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I want you to immerse yourself in the words of Jesus. I want you to immerse yourself in, in watching and meditating upon and studying his actions. Dorotheus smiles and he says, I want you to dive into Jesus. As we do so, we're going to mature. We're going to become, in Jesus' words, more perfect. When Jesus uses the word perfect, or when a biblical writer says perfect love casts out fear, perfect love casts out fear, it's more the idea of someone who's become more mature. Like a, a tree has a seed, you plant the seed in the ground, in that seed for the tree is DNA, the tree's DNA. It's not yet perfect, but the DNA is present in the tree. And Jesus is thinking, other biblical writers thinking, it's becoming perfect. How so? Its DNA is replicating itself as designed by God. So a, a, a perfect person, a perfect image bearer would not be somebody who's got a, a list of rules and regulations a mile long and can check off everyone every day. I've done all these things, I must be perfect. No, that's abhorrent. A perfect person is someone within whom the Holy Spirit is replicating God's DNA in us. We're becoming what we were always meant to be. And whenever an image bearer is experiencing that, there's a smile on her face. Dorotheus would be insistent the way we learn to love safely, sanely, powerfully, where we would never harm somebody else, take advantage of somebody else. The way we learn to do this is we dive into the wonder and beauty of Jesus himself. And finally, Dorotheus would in encourage us to move beyond our comfort zone. To move beyond our comfort zone. Take a minute, no rush, and ask yourself the question, what's my comfort zone? So here's, here's what happened to me. I think it was around the first year I was at UCLA. I got word that my parents were considering divorce. And this was a possibility that was absolutely 
horrific for me, hoping and praying that my dad and mom would stay together. And about two years later, when I was around the age of 21, I remember being at school, being at UCLA, and an official looking letter arrived. And it was the letter informing me that the divorce was finalized. It was as though someone had tossed a hand grenade into the family circle. It was all gone. And something happened to me then that I didn't recognize. There was some dynamic in me that said, Chris, this is, this is the way the world is. You must be in control. If you're not in control, you're not safe. Now, all my life, I've loved airplanes. I've loved airplanes. My dad was a pilot. I, I constructed airplanes when I was a kid. Well, what happened, I think related to my parents' divorce, I developed an irrational, phobic response to flying. I found when I got on an airliner, I started breathing more quickly. Uh, blood pressure, no doubt, was shooting up. I wanted off the moment I got on. That kind of irrational fear was the sign Something inside of me was saying, Chris, you are not safe. Why? You are not flying the airplane. And the fear got worse and worse and worse. Even while I was flying around the world to help other people with their own spiritual formation. So finally, what, what happened was this. I was I'm in Philadelphia. I'm supposed to be in Bangkok, Thailand, to be with 35 people from World Vision who had traveled from around the world to be in Bangkok, and they're waiting for me. And the fear, really terror of flying, was so great, I got to the airport, and I didn't get on the plane. And I got walked back out of the airport, got in my car, drove to the university, met with the provost. He knew I was supposed to be on the plane. And I said, I didn't get on the plane. And he said, yeah, I can see that. What are we gonna do? And I had to take steps, concrete steps, to overcoming the fear. Part of those steps had to do with my relationship with God. There was a part of me that still wasn't sure that God could be trusted in light of my past, in light of that divorce. Also, there were things I simply needed to learn more thoroughly about flying and about airlines and so on. So I am embarrassed to say both World Vision and my university paid for a fear of flying course. But one of the lines I still remember from a, this uh, 747 pilot because turbulence was especially what bothered me. He said, the turbulence might be bothering you. It's not bothering the airplane. I expanded my knowledge in the area of my life where I was afraid. And I learned, Chris, you don't have to be afraid. And then the third thing was, Chris, you're going to have to get back on airplanes. And God's truth, three months after I didn't get on that flight, World Vision said, Chris, we'd like you to come to the Philippines. Well, I got on the plane. Did I feel a little bit nervous? Yeah. It didn't change overnight. But I kept flying. See, I didn't want... I didn't want the comfort zone of my life. I didn't want my world to get so small. I wanted my world to stay large so I could help people. I didn't get on that plane in 1999. Now it's 2022 and something has happened in me where now the love of flying has returned 
And when I get on a plane, sometimes I am so relaxed that when the plane's heading down the runway for takeoff, I fall asleep. I'm actually, at times, enjoying turbulence. Just the fun of turbulence, the, the plane bouncing around a little bit. That is a miracle. Where are the areas in your life when you said, this far, no farther? And the Lord's saying, oh, dear child, I have more for you. Expand that comfort zone. Experience freedom in that comfort zone, the freedom to love, and your world will get much bigger in the way I had always planned for you. What could be better than moving beyond fear? I hear Dorotheus of Gaza saying, nothing. <laughs>